to the podcast where together, every Monday, we explore hospitality in its very broader sense. From culture and cooking, cocktails and coffee, nutrition and farming, politics and animal welfare, organic and sustainability, family and business, entrepreneurship, and much, much more. Come and learn with me, Mark Cribb, about where our food and our drink comes from and the businesses and more importantly the human beings that thrive on where we decide to spend our time and our money. Sign up to our weekly newsletter at humansofhospitality.co.uk and hit subscribe on your podcast player of choice. Okay, I'm recording this little intro on the 27th of September 2020 and what a week for hospitality. Whilst it was still pretty awful for many, I was also getting some good feedback recently from people with regards to July and August trade and even September for some was off to a reasonably decent start. Obviously not for the late night economy, but many general bars and restaurants I was chatting to and certainly some of the hotels were having some glimmers of positivity after a torrid 2020 so far. And then out of the blue, Boris is on the telly telling us to stop serving at counters and to close by 10pm. What has become apparent is that the government had absolutely no idea of the disproportionate impact this would have on our sector. At first, somewhat stunned, I think many of us scrambled around trying to find the reasons. Why 10pm? Why only sitting down? Just what is happening out there? Have we missed something? But it transpires. No. The government's own statistics show that we have almost the lowest transmission rate in the country, at less than 5% two weeks ago and less than 3% last week. Care homes, education and workplaces are all massively more responsible than us for COVID transmission. And that's incredible and something we should be very proud of as a sector. When you think of the millions of people that we've served since reopening in July, many more than would have visited schools or care homes, yet our transmission rates are tiny. And that is testament to the investment that we've made in PPE and training and systems and processes and risk assessments and fundamentally just knowing how to look after people well and safely because it is in our DNA. I'm stunned that the government can click its fingers and cause such chaos in our lives and our businesses. If you were planning a romantic weekend away that could easily cost you 250 quid a night for a nice hotel and a couple of hundred quid for a couple of nice meals and some nice wines, would you really bother at the moment, knowing the restaurant is going to close and send you up to bed at 10pm? And for what possible reason. You're staying in the hotel anyway and you'll be down for breakfast the following morning. And in the restaurant world, obviously losing the opportunity to turn tables and properly look after two sittings has a huge financial implication. But in many ways, worse is to look across your restaurant at all the happy customers enjoying a nice evening out in a safe and regulated environment who are spending good money with us and then having to interrupt their relaxed enjoyment by telling them they have to drink up at 9.45pm and be on the street by 10pm so that we can lock the doors for reasons that we cannot fathom. It is just not hospitality or in our nature to do so. The impact on my own seafront restaurant this week where we had turned one entire floor and a takeout over to counter service with space spread out along the terrace and the promenade and the beach was farcical. We took a well-managed, safe system that we'd evolved over the past two months to be running beautifully and turned it on its head and caused chaos with 48 hours notice. There is no way that with my team now having to come out from behind counters and wander through people taking orders and delivering food and drink that it has improved safety. It's done quite the opposite whilst adding significantly to costs. It is bonkers. Anyway, I could list dozens of reasons why this makes no sense but if you work in the hospitality sector you've probably had a shitty enough week. So let's speak to an awesome human being to make us all feel better and today I am chatting to Jose Pizarro, an utter gentleman and super warm and impressive Spanish hospitality legend. Jose and I recorded this remotely a few weeks ago and I really wish I'd gone to actually sit with him in his restaurant since he oozes hospitality out of every pore. 
He's famous for his three London restaurants and championing of Spanish produce for many decades. Jose touches on his books and his extensive travels through Spain and just how much he loves meeting other great humans and ensuring that their recipes are recorded and handed on to the next generations. We chat about his upbringing and some lovely memories about the smell of coffee and churros from his mum in the kitchen, who is now 87 years of age and still going strong. We talk about food culture in Spain and the UK and how we can try and improve our connection to food, particularly when you think of things like childhood obesity in this country. And I also find out that Jose's middle name is Manuel. And with a restaurant already called Jose, one called Pizarro and one called Jose Pizarro, I for one think it's time he used his middle name for the next one. I really, really hope you enjoy our chat. And as always, if you can just spare a minute, could you please pick up the device you are listening on and find the review section. Hit five stars and subscribe. And if I'm not pushing my luck too much, leave a few words. It really helps me out and it encourages wonderful guests to say yes to becoming on the podcast when I get in touch. That's a win-win since we both get to hear great interviews with great humans. Cheers. Okay, Jose Pizarro, thank you so much for joining me uh, on the podcast this morning. Hugely appreciated. Can you just explain to me and everybody listening, Jose, where in the world are you? Uh, now I'm in London and I'm in my restaurant in Vermont Street, uh, south of the river uh, called Pizarro. I'm sitting here in, my, in the PDR private room and uh, having a lovely cup of coffee and so looking forward to, to chat with you. Is yeah. where we are. <laughs> Excellent. Perfect. So you've got three venues now very much in central London, but you've also got your pub, the Swan Inn in, in, in Isha, so a little bit further out of town. Have they all reopened post-pandemic? And also well, post-pandemic, I guess we're still in it, but have they all reopened and how's trade been since you reopened? Uh, all open. We open one and the pub. We open the 4th of July and then the, the next one being open slowly after. Um, trading being interesting, uh, not too bad, as you can imagine, not great either. Uh, but the thing from the government, they uh, eat out to help out, being really, really good for us, really good for us. Um, and lucky, my business, uh, three of them are in a residential, area very very um, local and um, one of them in the city that is a little bit more challenge but the one here locals been looking after me very very well i have to say um, yeah that's good academy, yeah uh, trading interesting interesting as you can imagine but um, it's time to work hard and to look for new challenge no new challenge to just to go through this uh, these difficult times and challenging have you, have you, is it very different in the Swan than it is in the city? Because from what I'm hearing about London, is it's all you know being described as a bit of a polo mint. So you know the inside of central London is is quite empty, but the suburbs are actually really busy. Have you found it very different having the sort uh, of the, the diverse locations? Totally, totally. The two in Bermond Street are doing, like we say, okay. Uh, the one in the city is doing just surviving. I, I'm, I'm very very lucky that my landlords. Uh, in the in the in Bermondsey, in Bermondsey, sorry, in in Liverpool Street, they are looking after me very well, and uh, that means that it's um, it's good uh, it's good for us. Uh, Bermondsey doing well, Liverpool Street doing okay, uh, and the pub is doing extremely well. I have to say, extremely yeah. well in terms in the situation that we are, you know. Um, again, it's a very uh, lovely uh, locals and regulars than. Um, then, yeah, they, yeah, they love to to keep going to the pub and uh, and having a good time. That's it. This is where it's useful having a few a few venues and, and a few different yeah. styles, I suppose. What, what do you presumably for the for the city centre? You really need people to come back to the offices. That's the key thing that's going to make a difference for you, I guess, is it? Totally, totally. I get reports every week uh, of the occupancy, and uh, we talk about I think twelve percent of the occupancy in the city. That means that it's really, really, really low. Um, but it's still okay, you know. It's not. It's not that bad. I'm open now for five days, and I'm thinking to open even Saturdays, lunch okay. time. Then it's you know to cover to just um, to keep 
to keep my regulars happy and uh, anyway, to keep the, 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 the family as well, not the team. The team need to need to come back and uh, and uh, yeah, keep going. They were, no? it's they, not, they were it's excited to come back to work. I'm sure. Exactly, exactly. I think it's been horrible time to be in, in inside, and um, it's important for everyone to to go back to work and uh, and try to make more money. For law, being incredible, I think incredible for many people, for everyone really. Uh, but um, it's time to to get back and uh, enjoy enjoy because hospitality. Really, yeah. is 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 to 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 have that relationship with the with the customer. Yeah. This pandemic, this pandemic as well, so off the people really want to work and the people are lazy and want to stay at home. I have to say, few people, not many, I have to say, but some uh, just prefer to be at home and uh, and get the money from the government. Yeah, and it's, not. Yeah, it's tricky. It's tricky to know what the government can do, I suppose, to make people sort of reopen the offices, isn't it? A lot, a lot of the big companies in central London seem to be reluctant to bring people back. So uh, I don't know. Is there, is there more you think the government can do to help? Or uh, I think uh, they have to. They have to. I say the people need to be not forced because uh, the main thing everyone needs to be safe. But we need to go back. We need to go back. We need to go to buy our sandwich. We need to go to, to buy our coffee in the morning. We need to bring the economy and the, and the government, I think, be doing yeah, more or less. In a few things may be very good and other things may, may be very bad, but it's supporting to, to try to bring the economy. And we have to push ourselves to, to, to bring the economy. You know, stay home is, uh, I think, for many people is good. Uh, it's just uh, nice to wake up in the morning and do your coffee and then put your computer. Um, but definitely, it's nothing for me. And it's, <laughs> we have to, we have to, be, we have to be back and we have to push ourselves. For me, I think we close uh, the main restaurant Pizarro the twenty six or something like that of March, and we were working already in the eighteenth of April back to work. You know. Yeah. I, couldn't stay, I couldn't stay at home. Uh, you know, my 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 mind will be will be explode really. <laughs> yeah, you're 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 designed to be a busy human. What were you doing? Yeah. There? You, you pivoted a little bit into some delivery and, and a shop and some collection. Is that right? Yeah, we uh, we sit down in the sixteenth, and uh, me, uh, Valentina Monti, they had my my right hand in a few things in kitchen and mar- marketing and uh, all like that. See who she was not around, but um, we we decided to, to do something. We didn't know what to do. Uh, the idea I thought people still at home, people love cooking, and people were lovely having a lovely time baking. But we want to have the flavor that you love, you know, the Spanish flavor in this case. And we decided to 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 do a, a type of uh, finished at home tapas that everything was all, almost ready for you. The lamb was uh, was cooked. You have just to finish in a, in in water, in hot water. Are you saying bubbling, bubbling water? Yeah, yeah. simmering, simmering water, and then just put in the oven. Uh, the bread was already sliced for you. Just put in the oven. The tomato was with a, a little bit of garlic and olive oil to do the pan con tomate bread with tomato. And um, it was a really lovely range of of tapas that was very easy for for yourself to to finish. And uh, we came to the 19th, I, I think, in the kitchen, and we prepared to launch everything on the 25th of April. Um, big success, I have to say. Uh, sales were really, really great. And uh, the shop, we opened a shop as well, selling really everything we had, all the wines. I thought maybe we don't do any uh, mass profit, but locals are going to be very happy with that. And uh, we made the cash, you know. And that point, um, always, I think the cash flow is is very important. And, uh, yeah, and yeah, it was a really, really success. And the thing for me was really uh, it was good to be out of my house and yeah. and to be with the with the locals. And so you're going to keep that going, Jose, for the future, or is that just going to keep going? Going? Definitely, we are going to keep going for the future, and we are developing in different ways. That can be very interesting. Um, yeah, I, is, I think it's, uh, people, we want to go out. Customers, come, they want to come back. But sometimes you just want to be at home. And, uh, 
and enjoy a, a selection of Spanish flavors without no to be too complicated, without to be complicated. Yeah, it was interesting. The pandemic time was, uh, uh, yeah. yeah. Think- and do you produce all of that food in the, in the restaurant kitchen? Sorry, Isabel, but do, do you produce all of that in the restaurants or do you have a sort of, and, and can you, I suppose, once you're open and you're fully running again, have you got the capacity that you can do that from your existing kitchens? No, we are developing <laughs> something else now to, to be able to do that. Yeah. I think it's interesting, isn't it, how many uh, restaurateurs who said they would probably never get into home delivery have, have tried it in the lockdown and actually gone, you know what, this 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 is actually, you know, quite useful and, and works quite well. I was chatting to Adam Handling a couple of weeks ago who's done the same and Hawksmoor have done it as well, I think, haven't they? So, uh, But many of them seem to think that, yeah, it's, it's almost uh, a separate part of the business, but worth yeah. keeping going. Worth keeping. Never is going to be us uh, 25th of March or April, you know, because I think we were one of the first to, to start with that. That was absolutely incredible. And then the sales, you know, slowly, slowly um, keep the same. And then, of course, when the when the restaurant opened, bam, went a little bit down. No, a little bit, quite a lot of down. Um, but I think we'll come back. We want to go out now. We want to support the business. We want to support the hospitality. We want to support friends and locals. But uh, sometimes you just want to really eat well at home from and, and having without having to cook at all, you know? And uh, it's something I never thought, I never did many takeaways, uh, but now sometimes I think the quality of the of the, the takeaway, the eating out or eating in is absolutely amazing. Really, really, really good. Yeah. yeah, and I think it's a nice, nice way of doing it if people can finish the food at home because all too often restaurant quality food is not really designed to be cooked and then put on the back of a motorbike and taken three miles down the road, is it? But if you can send it in a way that you actually you finish it at home, then you can get much closer to the quality, I guess. Totally, totally, totally. Much better than, uh, yeah. I'm quite happy, I'm quite pleased and definitely something the business that hopefully we can even develop a bit better. We'll see. We'll see. We'll yeah. see okay. See and is this very much for, going. Yeah, good. Well, I'm glad you found a way through. Is it very much for delivery locally in London, or is this something you'll be able to do uh, across the country? Do you think? I think we'll happen. Yeah, a bit further from from my local areas. Hopefully. Yeah. Look, looking after your local community. So there's a certain irony, um, Jose, to the fact that you need to stay so busy when your background was was the opposite end of the spectrum, I suppose, to London, because you're from a little tiny village. Is it Talavan in, in, in Spain, where you were brought up on, on, on a farm? Do your family still live there, and do they still have the farm? Or? Uh, the farm is not there anymore. My brother has a few cows around, but nothing to, to live from. Uh, my family is still there. My mum is still there. And... Uh, it's a place that I'm so looking forward to go, my friend. <laughs> you know, I, I didn't see my mom since uh, February, and uh, I really need to go there and, and see her because she's, um, yeah. She's cool. do, you know, do you know when you're going? Do you have a date yet? Uh, I was supposed to be going last week. It was my mom's 87th birthday. Wow. And uh, I wanted to be, but uh, was a little bit risky for her. And quarantine is not good for me to come back and spend two weeks but um, I think I, I in September now in September I need to look for for a week uh, to go and then uh, come back I have to do quarantine but it's another project that I'm working and I can be at home writing yeah I was going to say you write books don't you maybe you yeah, can, uh, yeah, you can, you exactly. can spend some time productive yeah, at home. exactly exactly, exactly. It's, well, it's, well not. it's how I'm going to use my time when I come back it's still running the business because you can run the business a little bit not the kitchen really but um, taking things from, uh, from from my home um, and then I'm going to spend time to, to do some writing yeah okay. very, I have to say always writing is my it's going to be my sixth book book but always you learn so much, you learn so, so much. And uh, I feel, because I've been so busy in the last six months, really, since six or whatever, since uh, March, and I didn't have really time to to read more about, uh, you know, the area I'm going to be writing the book, and uh, I didn't have the time, really. And now I think I'm going to use, I need that learning that I didn't have, you know, that I need. Yeah. Which is the which is the area for the next book? Uh, it's going to be my area, Extremadura. 
Okay. It's going to be very focused in uh, where I'm coming from, but it's going to be very focused uh, with the very local, uh, old-fashioned recipes, my mom recipes. I think it's quite similar than the first book I wrote, uh, but even more into uh, the local people in my area. It's going to be hopefully it's going to be nice. It's going to be quite personal again. All of book, all books are very personal, no? But when you write about your mom and your friends from the from the area, I think it's can be can be very very interesting, very lovely. And, and can you write that from London, or do you need to get back out there and travel to, around and meet people? I to, yeah, I need to get back, and uh, I need to get back in a few times. I hope, yeah. but to be coming, yeah, uh, because it's important to feel. It's important to see that person cooking the recipe for you. It's lovely to see that uh, old guy cooking migas. Migas are fried bread, but um, with fried bread crumbs, and uh, everyone does in a different way. And uh, yeah, you need to be with that person there, and you need to taste, you need to see, you know, the feeling coming through through that, that, that person cooking that recipe. Yeah, it's, I have to go. It's why super, the book is supposed to be coming. This is uh, 2021. And now look like it's going to be in 2022. But give me more time to, to meet new people and, you know, to, to, to discover new things. Yeah. No, it must be it must be lovely to to keep because I know you you know you're you're well known for your uh, I said representation of Spanish produce whether that be the olive oil or the uh, or, or the the yamon and stuff like that but yeah you're you're very passionate about it so it must be amazing for you to have that excuse to sort of dive deep into the into the kind of regions and the countryside and, and meet all these people are there any particularly memorable people um, for, you know for, that you've met as a result of the books that you've written yeah it's few uh, in Catalonia everywhere. Everywhere I have to say, you make incredible, incredible, incredible people that really love to share what they do. They open the houses, they cooking for you, and they really uh, share everything they know. Um, and, and more and more and more, I can see that that, that kind of uh, not all people, but people have knowledge. They want to share and they want to keep those recipes for the future because, in some point, you know, so many recipes they get lost. You know? And I, I see those families that really say, Jose, uh, I know that you are writing this book. Um, I know my friend have, uh, uh, was cooking with you, but I really want to give you this recipe as well, because another way, maybe it's going to get lost. And you really meet those, uh, seriously, people open the house for you and uh, really, uh, really enjoy to share. I love, yeah. I love it. I love it. I'm incredible, incredible. I'm very, no, I'm, very fortunate. Yeah, it must feel like a real privilege, I guess, to, yeah, to take some of those old recipes and, and make sure that they, you know, live live another Big life. Yeah. Always be there, I hope. It's exciting. It's very exciting. I'm very looking forward to, not to the quarantine, I have to say, but looking forward to start putting everything uh, everything together and start doing a very good research um, and just uh, just calling my friends to 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 start organizing yeah yeah maybe the quarantine situation will change uh, jose or, or if not you just need to stay out there a little bit longer and, uh, yeah, don't, don't come back here and sit in your flat quarantine yourself traveling around spain uh, looking at amazing food and <laughs> yeah. meeting amazing people i need um, it I, I need it i need that uh, I'm missing, you know, uh, London is my home. I think UK is, my, is, is, is part of my, my, my heart, you know, my country as well, no? But I'm missing the, the time with, uh, with my mom and, uh, and my family. And this time, you know, your mom is 87. And she's a very strong woman, don't get me wrong. But, uh, and she will be for a few more years. But, um, this time is so important and so unique than... Uh, yeah, I'm missing. I'm missing that. I'm, I'm missing the the coffee, her coffee in the morning. I'm missing her cooking. Uh, yeah. yeah. But we'll have it soon. You will, yeah. So, so your mum. You said you know your mum is a is is a very good cook, but you were you were pretty much barred from the kitchen when you were younger. But presumably that upbringing then on the farm was this a commercial farm? It was actually supplying. Was, was it was it was it meat and and veggies and stuff? Was it supplying yeah. local markets or? My dad, he has, uh, when I was a child, he has uh, cows for milk, 
and then he has a very um, limousine breed done to raise um, uh, cows and, and male and female to sell to different people. Uh, but we have the vegetable garden, we have the hens, we have everything you need, really. Not everything, no, but almost everything. And uh, I was not allowed to be in the kitchen ever. Because, uh, my mom always she was with, uh, with my dad, and uh, my mom was like, you go away from here. I need to cook, and I want to enjoy this time I have for work. I think for the time she has for herself, you know? And nothing better than to produce incredible food for, for us. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a memory I have of my mom you know, when you wake up in the morning, in the morning and you the smell of churros, uh, the smell of uh, the, the, the lentils, uh, very lentil stew, very slow cooking or, or, or whatever she was doing. That always, always was really, really, really great, I have to say. That is great memories, great memories, and memories always are going to be with, with us. You know? Go to the to the farm and and just have always I say you know to have a a, a fresh uh, glass of milk straight from the cow or something something unique. Good memories, good memories. Yeah, very nice. My daughter's favourite food is is churros, and she also hates lentils, Jose. So I'm hoping that maybe she's going to be an amazing chef when she's an adult as well. <laughs> you know, I when I was a, a, a child, I hate lentils. I hate lentils so much. I couldn't understand the lentils. The smell was okay, but uh, the, the flavor for me was not. Until I was like five, maybe, I think uh, everything changed. But um, yeah, lentils was my my kind of uh, not the best, not the best thing on the plate for me. Yeah, well, she 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 shares your thoughts entirely on that, uh, Jose. <laughs> although although I appreciate you've changed your mind now. Um, you always talk so eloquently and with such passion about sort of the, the food culture, I suppose, in Spain. But you were inspired to come to the UK because of the sort of diversity of our food and our restaurants. I, I'm always interested to know why is it in Britain now? You know, we have this great reputation for really good restaurants, but we don't seem to share that sort of culture of, of food and appreciation. I, I know you talk often about sort of, you know, long, leisurely Spanish lunches and, and family lunches, and we don't really have that culture. Do you have any thoughts, I suppose, on, on why food is so much of maybe the, the, the culture in Europe, but not in Britain, yet we've ended up with good restaurants? Any thoughts on that? I think, I think uh, we're going, we going more and more and more and to that way. I think people really enjoy lunches at home and entertaining people or is in the people around me or, or my friends and but I do see that we love now more entertaining more to bring people at home and and having a good time um I see that more and more and more is happening but before maybe it was the in- industrial revolution that changed everything I think I don't know but uh, I can see now that uh, yeah I'm not, I'm not inviting many times to houses, I have to say, you know, but I love entertaining and people love to come to my, to our home and, um, and having a good time. There's nothing better than to be sitting around a table with, uh, with friends and, fam- and family, uh, shopping, cooking and, and eating and drinking. I think it's something unique that brings people together, I think. I think, no, I think it's a, I think it's a lovely thing. I can't, I can't help but feel that they do that around you, Jose, because you make it happen and you invite them and that the rest of Britain is is still um, wolfing down lunch at the desk and then and then maybe getting together slightly more for dinner. But it's uh, if, you, if you can keep the revolution going, that would be amazingly we appreciated for the rest of us. We have to. I, everyone is busy, you know. I would love to be at home every day with my partner having lunch with uh, there. Uh, everyone is busy and I think dinner is important. Uh, to be with the with the with the, the family, no? but I can see that people want uh, entertaining. People want to 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 bring people together. It's my my feeling, really. I do anyway. I love I love to to, uh, to bring people uh, to the restaurant or, or to our home to to enjoy. You know, nothing better than to go to the market thinking about what you are going to be cooking, even bring your friends to the market and then go to the to the house and uh, to home and cooking together, just open that bottle of wine and and living the, 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 the life, you know? This is the, that's the most incredible thing. I, I think it's something that I learned from my family, you know? 
my mom uh, always loved to cook and uh, and and to to say guys sit down now and talk about the day and uh, i think it's great i love it i love it and it's something that i would like to have so much money and just to do that. bring friends and uh, entertaining and uh, yeah that would be my my dream to have a lovely house somewhere and to do that every day for my friends yeah that would that 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 would be perfect. Uh, I, I think I mean a, a lot of your appreciation, I guess, of food m- must come or at least be helped, even if you weren't allowed in the kitchen by the fact you were allowed to farm. But we do seem to have a little bit of, a, of an issue in this country, and I think it's our responsibility as as uh, restaurateurs and of chefs to help people become more connected i guess with where our food comes from and and the farms uh, and and try and tell the stories because you know one of the issues we have in this country at the minute is, is a lot around childhood uh, obesity and, and child poverty has been in the news a lot in the last few days um have you seen any good examples do you get to work with with any schools how, how do you think we help this country again culturally become a bit more connected i suppose with where our food comes from in the same way that you are in europe like we say, I say before, I was not allowed to eat the kitchen, but I was allowed to, to, to smell and to see my dad just to bring the tomatoes. I was allowed to, to go to the vegetable garden just to, to take a carros straight from the, from the land, to go to the spring water, to take the sun out and have that carrot. I think it's so important that we have to, to, to the schools need to, need to teach people about ingredients, about food, about the food, where the food is coming from. I, I always, my family always had one or two pigs in the, in the farm. And, uh, and, and I knew, I saw that animal every single day of my life. And I knew that animal is going to be my food for the rest of the year. It was my friend, and it's quite cruel to say, but at the same time, it's, it's our food. You know, I knew, I saw the hens, I, I know, I, I saw the cock around, but I saw that it's going to be one day a, a, a lovely uh, chicken chicken stew. And it's something that we need to teach to everyone. It's nothing wrong to, to fishing, it's nothing wrong to, 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 to eat uh, if the meat is good and is sustainable and animals are, are being treated properly. And I do understand vegan, I do understand vegetarian, but uh, and I think it's a it's a it's a good thing. But we need to teach people it seeing they are childs and where the meat is coming from, where the fish is coming from, and um, and it's, I think it's the government in the government hands and very important for us as well to to to, to bring childs to the restaurant. Always to my friends, I say, anytime that you want to bring any people any kids to my kitchen, feel free. To, to bring them to see what we do and to and to learn, you know, because uh, obesity is uh, is a big thing and and we have to eat properly. We have to eat properly and we have to eat local and, and fresh. Yeah. Okay. Well, I will. Uh, I'll try. I, my my little lockdown project has been starting my own kitchen garden at my house, Jose. So I've been growing all sorts of uh, veggies over the summer. I can't say that I've managed to inspire my my twelve year old daughter to particularly come out in the garden uh, and help me. She she has a general loathing, I think, for anything that I've cooked. But I love the idea um, that yeah, surely you'd, you'd like to think that by demonstrating and by seeing it, as it did with you, I suppose, because at the time you weren't particularly appreciative of it. But but twenty years later. Uh, when you were in the kitchen, all of a sudden you realized how, how useful it was, I guess. Exactly. I didn't appreciate uh, I was a very naughty, no bad boy, but quite naughty. And, um, and my dad, nothing was for me that uh, in September, October, in uh, 6 in the morning, 7 in the morning, to go and pick up olives. That was horrible. It was cold. My hands were freezing. I couldn't even move my fingers uh, from pick up the olives. Uh, to produce olive oil, uh, but I do understand olive oil now, and I do understand how important it is to to recognize that uh, olive olive oil is uh, is amazing and it's it's not easy to produce, you know. And I love olive oil, and even, even I hate it that uh, that mornings in the in the in the, in the fields uh, picking olives. And like we say, we need to understand where things come from. Yeah, perfect. Well, I'm going to make my daughter listen to this so that she, <laughs> she appreciates that later oh, in her life she's going to love it. She would hate it to be in the field <laughs> at 
<laughs> five, six in the morning, uh, picking olives and telling you it's not, it's not going to be fun. No, talking of olives, though, because you 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 uh, you know you've you've been a real kind of ambassador, I suppose, for Spanish produce. So, what's the difference then between how you make? You know, we we can buy olive oil at you know a pound, or we can buy olive oil at twenty five pounds. How's it made? What's the difference between a good olive oil and a bad oil? What can you just explain the love that's going on behind the scenes? Definitely. Uh, for example, uh, my olive oil is costing little price at the moment is 15 pounds for half a litre. No? Uh, that olives, they are picked up by hand uh, when they are really in the best time ever. Um, all the olives going from the mill to the, from, sorry, from the tree to the mill and it's produced the juice in less than six hours. And to produce a liter of this olive oil can go until, I think, 15 kilos of olives. You know? Wow. It's not the same that, than uh, uh, everything at all is doing by machine and uh, to, to don't burn and don't heating up the, the juice. O- olive oil, in the end, is a juice, no? Um, and everything is just to control uh, the olives that doesn't need to be in perfect condition is uh, some of them are already uh, bad to say uh, the, the the taste will be completely completely different and the olive oil when you just open the bottle then need to be nice fresh you need to feel like the grass is just being cut you know it's because the olives are still in they are pick up in a perfect condition when you buy uh, olive oil in uh, in one pound a liter, that olive is being already fermented. And the flavor is not natural at all, and uh, it's just produced even heating water, heat water. They uh, horrible ways for you to produce. Not horrible. Nothing is gonna kill you, but will never be the same way that is produced uh, a great great olive oil. Um, it's quite. Uh, you need to understand the olives that you like. Um, some olives are, are more are stronger than another one. You just need to keep trying until you found the olive oil that you like. You know? um, and the olive oil I grow up with. For me, the olive oil has to be strong, has to be peppery, uh, and need really need a, a, a big body. You know? um, it's why I grow up with that flavor. Um, and you, right. and you cook with that really good olive oil as well. Then you don't just use the cheaper stuff for cooking. In, in like a British person would use the you know the good stuff as a dressing and the, and the bad stuff for cooking. But you you know like wine, you cook with the good stuff. Is that right? You, you have to you have to cook with you know when some people say oh, can I use this uh, this uh, 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 this wine it's, it's cork and it's, it tastes horrible. I say why you are gonna cook with that? That flavor is gonna go to the food. You don't need to spend a hundred pounds on a bottle of wine for cooking. Definitely not, um, but buying a nice uh, wine is, uh, for cooking is, is important, definitely. Ingredients is the best, and um, more for my style. What I do is, is just, you know, it's based in great ingredients, and um, you cannot really uh, cover the flavors, you know? You cannot. Olive oil, definitely, uh, don't even cook with, uh, with 15 pounds liter uh, or half a liter of olive oil but don't buy those uh, they are you know, flavor are gonna be there definitely okay find a find a middle ground um you're also famous for sort of uh, introducing us uh, to uh, iberico uh, yamon um and I wondered, because something that makes the, the, that special is that the pigs get to go out and, and eat the acorns, isn't it? And I did a podcast a few months ago, actually. Did, I don't know, do you know about the panage season in the New Forest? Have you ever heard of that? No. So the, so the panage season, this is a tradition, I guess, the New Forest. I don't know if you've been there, but it's yeah, uh, yeah, in between yeah. where you and I are, basically. But it's a tradition there that in autumn, when the acorns drop from the trees, then uh, the local commoners are allowed to uh, release their pigs onto the land and to go and eat all the acorns under the trees because it's good for the forest because otherwise the, the acorns are poisonous. Uh, to the ponies and uh, and stuff ah, like yeah, that. So yeah, we have yeah, this yeah, pan art season. What we don't unfortunately then have is is the weather to uh, to to dry it and to cure it, I suppose, and turn it into into beautiful ham. But uh, you should come down and try some of that pan arch pig next time you're in the forest because uh, they also rave 
uh, about the impact of, of the acorns. But uh, yeah, Iberico ham, that's another love of yours. Is that right? Is, for me, when I arrived here um, so long ago, uh, it was difficult. For, uh, I was with my ham, you know, because in the end, I, I knew that I had to promote uh, Spanish ingredients. You know? And when I saw, when I was with my ham first, or so people come to the restaurant and say, oh, this is nice in Parma ham. Look, Parma ham is nothing wrong. I think okay, it's a great ingredient. Uh, as they say, serrano ham, you know, in Spanish. But it's far from jamón ibérico, totally far. Jamón ibérico is something unique from the moment that uh, the animals being burned, gone, until you uh, have a slice of ham that can be six years time, you know? It's, uh, the animals are completely wild. The quality I use is uh, is cinco jotas. Uh, for every single animal to get the quality, you need two hectares of land. That is, is absolutely amazing. How wow. I don't know how many uh, football camp or whatever it's called. It's, it's huge to get that quality. And uh, it was hurting me when people say, "Oh." Serrano ham or Parma ham, that was just like, no, please, it's ham only very good. Try this one, try this one, and then you will do understand. Uh, it was difficult, as you can imagine, to, to say to the customer that it's going to be, uh, I sell 20, for 26, 60 grams for 26 pounds. Uh, yeah. uh, to, to, to put that, as you know, uh, uh, to, to your customer, to your customer will be like, wow, this is expensive. When you try, and you explain to 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 the, to the customer that why it's like that, and you just put that kind of uh, a slice of um, of jamón ibérico in your tongue, and all the flavor, the sweetness, the uh, the nuttiness coming through 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 that fat, from that oil is something something incredible. And uh, if you told me like 15, 16 years ago, I'm gonna be selling, I think more. But before, no, now, of course, uh, I think it was around 500 hams a year. Uh, that was, um, I will never believe it. Uh, customer do understand quality, and, uh, and we are happy to pay for, for something unique. You know? And we pay for a good wine, or a good caviar, or a very good car. I think we are now happy to pay a very good money for, for a very amazing ham. Yeah. No, it's exciting. It's exciting to see the, uh, yeah, the British, I suppose, changing their, their, their appreciation for food. So, so what made you, you came over here in, in, in 1998, looking to kind of expand your, uh, yeah, I don't know, diversity, I suppose, uh, uh, of food. Um, you spent 12 or 13 years, you know, working in, in other people's restaurants. What was it that motivated you when you left uh, Bindisa? What was it that motivated you to open up your, your own restaurant in your own name? Was there a particular trigger that, that made you decide to do that? No, I think it's, you know, when you just are a chef, you just want, you, 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 you just really need to, to open your place. No, not for kind of ego or kind of anything. It's because I think the way that you develop your career, no? And uh, I sold my shares in Vindisa, and I was lucky enough to, to be able to, to, to open my, my places. And um, I, think, I think it was nice, nice feeling to, to see the grandfather. My, my, my grandfather, he, has, he had a, a bar in my village called Pizarro. And it was a nice memory of, uh, of him to, to be able to, to have that Pizarro in in the, the UK. Um, and I think it's important for, it's a challenge. I love challenge. And um, when I left in this uh, it, was, uh, it was a nice challenge to, to open your own places. No? And I'm uh, very happy, very pleased to, very pleased to come to the UK to learn different cuisines. I think in the end I'm doing Spanish. And uh, <laughs> I'm very happy to, to be able to, to enjoy my customers. Yeah, back back to the best. Do you remember that first day that you you opened Jose the first place and and, and how it felt? You know that that morning to be opening the doors of your own restaurant. It was um, it was a challenge. Um, I thought it was gonna be like seventeen people for lunch and thirty four for dinner. And um, when we opened the doors with no bookings, we were just mad. People coming from every 
everywhere. And uh, as you can imagine, it was very high cry, as you, as you can imagine. It uh, was, a, was a challenge, a very happy moment, very uh, touching, but was a challenge in the beginning, I have to say, until, until we organized everything, because it was so busy since the beginning, and I never thought to, to, to be able to, to do that amount of, of customer. Um, yeah. Because it's, it's a very small place, isn't it? But you just you just turn the tables constantly, presumably all the way from from lunch through to dinner, do you? Yeah, it's, uh, I think it's thirty two square meters, three hundred and twenty square foot. Um, yeah, it's it's content. It's, it's just it's it's the the place that you think that you are in Spain. You know, it's that local bar in my village that everyone is coming in and out for a caña. And, uh, and a pinch of tortilla or, or a plate of ham is constantly it's that feeling that uh, is uh, is busy but is very well managed and uh, it's no attitude the family the team is absolutely incredible and uh, yeah just sitting there uh, a glass of sherry and a plato de jamón ibérico patatas bravas or whatever. And it's a it's a very happy place. It's a very happy place that been for the last uh, nine and a half years already. I love it. I love it. I love all my places. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but Jose is something is something very special. Yeah, yeah the, the first and the big love. How long was it from from opening Jose until you opened your second venue? Six months. Okay, that's pretty quick. Was that was that because it was so busy in Jose you needed the space? Or? The thing is, uh, Jose was uh, the tapas bar I was always dreaming for. I found a place in Bermondsey, uh, just around Pizarro, but I was dealing with that place for like six months. But someone else came and took the place after design, after we, we dealing with, you know, solicitor, lease, but all, uh, someone else came with uh, big money. And I didn't have to. And they bought the property. That means that I was completely destroyed. Can you imagine? Six months dealing with the hopefully opening a restaurant and then don't have anything. And uh, and that week the Jose site came up. And I saw it and I love it. And I thought always I want to have this type of uh, expanse. Tapas bar, proper, small, uh, never thought it was going to be busy, but I thought it's going to have the, the feeling, no? And uh, we opened, it was busy, but always you need, as a chef, you need a main restaurant, no? And when we opened Jose, uh, the site of Pizarro came up, and I saw it, and I thought it's going to be great. And that, that's it, this is what happened. Uh, I never thought to have two restaurants in the same street. I was looking for one, and then I finished for with two. Uh, I was very keen when the, you know when that side, the, the first side, uh, came out the the table. Uh, I was like oh, destroyed, I say. But yeah. my dad always say things happen for a reason. And uh, the reason that that side came out is that Jose came in, no? Jose and, and Pizarro. And uh, yeah, it was, um, yeah, good timing. That's, that first building that you didn't get, did that open as another restaurant? Same. Did the, the building that you didn't get, did that open as a restaurant, as somebody else's yeah. restaurant? Yeah, yeah, someone, someone is else. It, is it still there? It's still, no. <laughs> They yeah, are good. Same. <laughs> no, 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 no. You, you no. should have been yours. No, uh, no, I know, uh, but it's still a lovely place uh, now. Uh, yeah, okay. Lovely Good. people running the place, and um, you know. But in that time, it was like, oh no, I was new in this business. I really didn't know much about uh, what is going on. I mean, how to how to easy it was you know to be in a, a site for six months and, and something came in and took it. I think yeah. that can happen, you know, because. Uh, I think the mentality I had was the mentality my dad had and has. It was like, you agree this site is going to be yours, you agree this cow is going to be yours for £100, doesn't matter if someone else coming after and that cow 
and offer you 120. You know, you agree with, and when you agree something, it's done. You know, and I thought that side was mine, but no, it was not. Someone else with uh, with big money came and took it, and that's it. But yeah, uh, because I'm the most important thing. The most important thing in the end, you learn, and if you learn, can be difficult in the beginning, um, but you know for next time. Yeah, and business is 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 very different, and all about learning, and and I think it's very different, I guess, from just being a chef to being a restaurateur. So, what are the key things that you love about the business of of, of restaurants, and and what do you maybe uh, you know hate or, or or like less about the business side? I hate numbers. I never be good in numbers, I have to say. But <laughs> in the end of the day, uh, a restaurant is a business. It's a business, and you have to look after every single number. And uh, a penny matters uh, more now than ever. Um, I will say that, yeah, numbers is not my, the thing I love, but it's something very important that you need to, you need to keep the eye very, very, very close. Um, I think the thing I love about this, uh, the, the business side is, uh, because I haven't been learning, I'm still learning a lot. It's something I never thought I would be a restaurant town. The, you know, you never know how much is behind, you know, and, uh, and you learn every single day, and you learn, and you need to keep the eye, That's it. because uh, it's a business. It's a business that you employ many people, and you need to, you need to pay them, and you need to pay the suppliers, and you need to pay many many things at the end of the day. You know? But I love it. I love the side of um, I love the adrenaline as well, and I think it's bringing. Uh, so, so, so now that you've got four venues, and I get you know, it means you can't be on the pass. Is is there a sort of typical uh, Jose day? Do you do you tend to be travelling between the venues, or are you much more, you know, the kind of marketing PR man now? What is a what is a Jose? What's your dream day, I suppose, and what does a normal day look like? And the normal day is uh, very early. First thing is coffee, and then look after all the emails. Uh, try to sort out the, all the emails and read the reports. I get reports from all my sites, every single lunch and every single dinner. But before, always I try to read reports uh, before to eat, you know, and I do the first thing in the morning. I need to, to sleep well, you know, so always see something happening, good or bad, you know, but when something can make you a little bit stressed, it's, uh, it's better than sleep with but emails first thing in the morning and then just go to the restaurant and uh, and, uh, and deal with the day it's, uh, it's important to to have touch with uh, with every single chef uh, I, I think it's important for me to be in the kitchen as well is uh, see I, I have to do PR you have to do marketing you have to go up and down uh, but um, now that uh, I've been in the kitchen more than ever uh, I do enjoy it I do enjoy to go back to to the adrenaline first, you know, before service, and everything has to be ready. And uh, to have a coffee with your team, with the family, is uh, is amazing. And to see the customer, and to see the customer, uh, you know, we are here for more than nine years, and, um, and we have uh, regulars that even were with me before British. And, uh, and that's the important thing, you know, it's uh, marketing, you have to do marketing, you have to do a little bit TV or whatever, but in the end of the day, the restaurant is the best marketing, to be in the restaurant is the best marketing for yourself, um, because people like to see you, and I love to be with you, that's it. Kitchen is the thing I do enjoy every single day. Yeah, I think there's a lot of people I've been speaking to who've, who've had to sort of get get back onto the coal face of their business as a result of the pandemic. And actually, you know, it's a really great reminder of just how much fun it is and the support from, you know, the public and, and from your regular customers. Uh, it's very humbling, I think, isn't it? When, it you're, is. when you're a restaurant, uh, they, they really, it's quite emotional, the, the gratitude and, and how much people want you to survive and find a way through. That's it, the point. So many customers I saw these days in the eat out and help out and even before that, was like, guys, we are going to be with you to support you. We don't want you to fail. We want to see the family. We want to see the team here again and again. And I have to be very touching, I have to say. I have to be very touching how 
or local, some people than that regular, some yeah. that they just really, really care. Really yeah. And it's what, as you say, bring you back to those, you know, to those times and, uh, yeah, when we start. It's, it's all about, it's all about people. And it's all about the family, great family I have here, you know, great team and uh, great customers. Yeah, yeah, very motivational. Speaking of which, and, and drawing to a close because I'm conscious of time, but the future then, I mean, you, are you, one, have you got a middle name, Jose? Because I'm conscious that you, you've got a place called Jose, somewhere called Pizarro, Jose Pizarro. Do you have a middle name you can use or do you need to stop uh, opening restaurants now? I have Manuel. It's my middle name. Manuel? <laughs> yeah. That's a, that's, a, that's a classic hospitality name in British culture. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Some people say, Better don't open a restaurant with Manuel, or, or better <laughs> open a restaurant with Manuel. I don't know what it's going to be good or not. Uh, I think it would do well. I think we would appreciate the irony. That would be great. <laughs> at the moment, um, I, I, not, I don't know what is coming, happening tomorrow. Uh, but today, um, I'm very happy with what I have. Uh, and I think it's time to consolidate again. It's time to, to, to enjoy. And, uh, and it's time to, to get through maybe for two, for the next two years. Um, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know what is happening tomorrow, or maybe later someone coming and say, let's open something else out. Uh, but now, now sitting in my, in my restaurant is, uh, is uh, consolidate we have, what we have um, and enjoy this yeah. thing. Tomorrow, I know. I think I think that's right, isn't it? That's got to be the key at the moment for anyone in hospitality who's managed to reopen is just uh, just enjoy it and uh, yeah, the, the pleasure of the customers. Do you think one day you will um, you'll open somewhere back in Spain, maybe a hotel or a restaurant, or or do you think only uh, now? I don't think hotel or I don't think restaurant is going to happen. I would like to open a kind of bed and breakfast there. Uh, can be my type of retreatment. Not re- not re- we have the time there. We have time time to spend. Um, doing what I love to do, like we said before, entertaining in a beautiful space, not huge, small, but um, yeah, that will be my, my dream, a kind of bed and breakfast where I can keep doing what I love to do, that is uh, hospitality, because hospitality in the end is, um, is entertaining people, it's not, it's not about us, it's about the customer coming through the door to enjoy and we have to make them to enjoy that is hospitality and that will be for me my dream one day in Spain maybe to have that kind of a small bed and breakfast where people come and, uh, and enjoy that is my yeah. thing my that would be amazing uh, you have such a reputation for being such a warm and uh, and hospitable and and friendly human that i'm sure uh, it would be full up for uh, there'd be a bit there'd be a couple of years waiting list on it i'm sure jose so uh, so good luck with that uh, look, thank you so much for sparing oh, the time it's you. it's great to virtually meet you where should people go if they want to follow your uh, adventures jose either either the business or you personally is there a particular social media channel that you're more active on or is instagram i think is the word we are now um, jose Pizarro, as simple as that jose underscore Pizarro is where i'm i am and, uh, and where you can see what is going on in in our life my friend is uh, okay the place to found found it but Perfect. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's a lovely chat, and hopefully we can meet properly soon around a, a tapas and some tapas and a nice uh, and a nice glass of uh, wine. That always helps. I have to say, always helps. <laughs> Amazing. We will definitely make that that happen, Jose. But thank you so much. We really appreciate you sparing the time. All the best. So there you have it, a lovely chat with Jose, and I'm sure you agree, he is a great hospitality human. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the conversation. If you did, as I said, please go to the review section on the app you're listening on, uh, click on five stars, click on subscribe, that would be really helpful. If you go over to the website, humansofhospitality.co.uk, you can subscribe to my weekly newsletter there. Uh, You can also find the links through to Jose's social media channels and through to his website on the show notes. And you can even click on the Patreon page and become a supporter of this podcast to help us stay on the air. Okay, thank you so much. I will be back next Monday with a brand new conversation. Cheers.